and welcome again, everybody, to another Aquarium podcast. Uh, we've been really busy over lockdown, and we thought today we would chat to you a little bit about all of the stuff we did in the run-up to getting the aquarium ready for reopening. And although we had lots of time and we were busy throughout the whole of lockdown, um, it was still a bit of a rush to get everything ready and there was an awful lot to do in that last week prior to reopening. And um, one of the biggest jobs was a collection trip, which both Chris and Fraser, who are on the call with me, were involved with. Uh, So uh, I'll start off by introducing Fraser and Chris to you and and then they will tell us a little bit about their trip. So we've got Chris Rowe, the displays officer. Hi, everybody. And we've got Fraser McKay, who is our acrist. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for joining me this morning, guys. Um, so do you want to tell me a bit about how you organized the collection trip? I think that mostly fell to you, right, Chris? Yeah, I tend to um, take the take the lead on, on organizing it and... Um leave the others to actually do the diving side of things uh yeah what we tend to do is organize our west coast dive trips we try and do one maybe two a year um based around the tides um so the first thing i'll do is have a look at the tides for Loch Harren or plockton as the the nearest tidal center um just to find out what the tides are like because of over sea locks are a nice safe places to dive um Loch Harren especially has quite a quite a fast running tide so we want to make sure that we're diving at slack water where it's not either flowing in or flowing out so the first thing we'll do is decide which day which day is suitable to go um and then realistically it's a case then of organizing the vans and all the transportation equipment um and all the fish collection equipment and diving equipment and everything that needs to go along with us um we've got several lists that we can use in order to make sure that we've got everything and we do tend to double triple quadruple check that we've got everything going in the van because there's nothing worse than getting over there and discovering you you're missing your mask or or something (laughs) yeah yeah you've left one of the fins behind or something like that um so yeah we've got a whole load of lists and then it's a case of getting across there and deciding where we're going to dive and that very much depends on what animals we're going to collect um and organizing who's diving fraser do you want to say something about the diving side of things that we did um yeah so uh usually it's mostly invertebrates that we go for so we have a, a seasonal die off of some of our inverts um it happens every year it happens i think in most places because some of these animals aren't that long living um so we get things like brittle stars uh, occasionally we'll have accidents with animals or animals will get uh, attacked or knocked over so some of our more sensitive animals like um sea whips and sea pens Uh, we've had um, incidences where they've been killed by other tank mates Um, crabs for example might knock them over so it's usually things like that that we're after Um, so we obviously as Chris just said determine our dive sites based on whether it is those animals that we're going for or if we're going for something a bit chunkier like a big spiny starfish or things like dead man's fingers which are a type of coral Um, and then we basically just get in the water we usually dive as two-man teams Uh, we have dived as three-man teams in the past or four-man teams depending on how many we've got available Um, and then we obviously work as buddy groups and buddy pairs and we get kitted out in full dry suits full scuba gear with ponies um, for supplying other people if we need to and then we take collection tarps or pipes Basically, depending on what we're after, we'll take the appropriate collection vessel to put them in. So if we're going after big rocky type uh, dead man fingers, uh, we can put them into like carry bags. If we're going after more delicate brittle stars, we'll put them into little tubs. Uh, And then we just basically descend down. We record roughly how long we're going to be in. We record roughly how long it's going to take. And we make sure we're going to suitable depths. So we're all certified um, paddy dive masters or above, which means we're capable of diving down to 30 meters, 40 meters um, for some of us. So we make sure that our dives are all coordinated within our restrictions and limitations uh, and then that's that down we go and basically we spend about 45 minutes or so under the sea or under the lock as it were um, carefully picking up and collecting various animals um, and then we surface back up put them into a, a giant collection tub which is in the back of the van and sorting them out carefully and neatly so that everybody's got their own space and 
allocated area in the back. Uh, and then we move around to usually our second dive site because both sites are in different locations. Uh, and then we repeat the process. Um, it's quite a long day. Um, our last trip was a total of 17 and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that was uh, for myself and our colleague, uh, Mr. Rickard. Um, so yeah, so we did a total of 17 and a half hours from start to finish because we were the ones in the van with all the equipment. Uh, sorry, not all the equipment, all the animals. Yeah. Um, obviously due to covid we had to go in separate vehicles so uh we we took the the beef beef truck as we call it so the animals the ones with all the animals in um, and we basically processed them and dealt with them all when we got back to the aquarium that evening mm -hmm. so of course the trouble is is um you tend to forget that by the time you've come back from i mean the diving itself as you said is only 45 minutes at each dive site so the yeah. diving can be quite quick um but you forget that it's a three and a half hour drive across the west coast um, and then when you get back here you can't just kind of lock the van and go home and um, there's all the animals in the back all need putting somewhere safe in the aquarium mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah it's quite a long it's, it's a long day yeah. long day for well, it's a long day for everybody involved but um yeah you guys had a had a especially <laughs> long day on a couple of weeks back but it's so worth it though because it, it really brings the tanks to life having all of those invertebrates in there and it just adds so much more and it makes the tanks a, a very realistic habitat because it looks a lot like it does in nature, doesn't it, once you have all of those invertebrates in the tank. I think a lot, a lot of that stems from us bringing weed back as well. Um, one of the things we really struggle with on this coast of Scotland, so over on the east coast, is that the the East Coast tends to be a much harsher environment than the West Coast. So the weed and bladder racks and similar types of weed all grow very strongly on the rocks. So if we want to exhibit them in the tank or allow the fish to hide amongst them and allow the invertebrate to crawl all over them, if we wrench them off the rocks, they tend to die off really quickly. Yeah. Whereas the West Coast has it's a much more placid environment in the sea locks. So the bladder racks all grow on tiny little pebbles Mm -hmm. And it makes it much easier for us to bring back. So mm -hmm. every time we do West Coast dive trips, we always throw a fairly large tub in the back of the van that we stack full of weed. And then Fraser um, had fun over the couple of days after the um, the dive trip, putting all this weed out. And I think it's that that makes so much difference for tanks. Yeah, um, absolutely. They're, they're not bare tanks. They're they're naturally themed with living weed. And hopefully the weed that we collected will, will last for quite a while because it should continue to grow on its little pebble. Yeah, because it's completely intact. The whole uh, whole fast and everything it was brought intact because you brought the rock that it was growing on as well. Yeah. And um, we also did a kelp collection just before uh, opening. Do you want to tell us a little bit about collecting kelp? Because that's quite labor intensive as well, isn't it, guys? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's um it's not quite as bad as a west coast dive trip um the, the the kelp collecting we're lucky that we can get kelp directly straight from the aquarium so the gullies in mcduff um just on the rock pools by the side of the aquarium are very rich in kelp um growing but unfortunately it grows at about four meters deep so you have to dive for it so the way that we do it and the way that we've developed um over the years is to put one person in a boat a little rubber dinghy um and two divers underneath the boat and the divers go down and gently pry the kelp off the rocks um kelp's a much bigger plant so you can actually take it off the rock uh with the hold fast intact without ripping it um so we try and take the hold fast as as whole as possible because again that will make the make the plant last longer the guys will collect it all into bundles tied up with a rope and then bring it up to the surface and whoever's floating around on the boat will haul it up and put it inside the boat. So if you're supervising in the boat, you gradually get higher and higher and higher sat on top of this <laughs> mound of kelp, uh, which makes it's it, it back, back in entertaining, entertaining. Yeah, as the boat gets lower and lower. Yeah, um, yeah, it's all good fun. Uh, and then when we've got a boatload, we um, paddle it all back into shore and then stick a radio call out to everyone else who's back at the aquarium to help haul it up the beach. So you haul it all up, um, all the kelp separately from the dive equipment and the boat, and then pull the boat back up the beach, put all the kelp back in the boat, and then we wheel it around the road. So if there's any local residents around here have been held up behind a boatload of kelp, we apologize that we're quite slow. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, we haul it around the road and back into the aquarium, and then it goes up our um, dive uh, void so up on the winch straight into the tank 
and then either later that day or the next day uh, the guys go in and collect together little bundles of kelp and position it strategically around the kelp tank um, occasionally kind of using rocks to hold it in place or cable ties to hold it back make sure it gets a nice sway <laughs> Yeah, we try we try and put them where the jets of water are. So we've now got a, an upwelling system in the tank. So if you can put the kelp by the by the upwells, and it keeps the fronds in suspension and keeps it alive a little bit more. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, that makes a huge difference to the tank. And because we've got uh, that open air. Um kelp tank the main kelp tank is open to the air the kelp gets natural sunlight and so it can continue to grow as well throughout the season so yeah the fish love it when we put the kelp in don't they you can really tell that they're excited and they enjoy hiding amounts their fronds they get a bit yeah, too make... excited sometimes <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> it, make, it makes a much more natural environment for them as i yeah. say they can use it as camouflage and um use it as hidey holes and they're not reliant on the bits of pipe or rocks that we put in for them yeah, uh, the rats, the rats in particular. You often see the rats hiding amongst or mm. hiding behind the the rock work. So when the the seaweed comes out, you can see them all dancing them out amongst the seaweed. So and they actually yeah. change color in accordance. So they'll go from like a, a sort of yellowy orange to more of a reddish color. I've noticed as the as the seaweed goes in because they'll start hiding amongst it. Yeah. So they just adjust themselves a little bit more to that kelp. Yeah, and it's important for the cat sharks as well, isn't it? Because as soon as the kelp goes in, they're all like, "Yay!" <laughs> and there's Start tons of eggs egg. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tons of eggs attached to all of the kelp fronds, so that's great to see as well. Okay, yeah, the, other, the other thing we tend to get is an influx of tiny baby starfish, because oh, yeah, um, in amongst all the all the holdfasts, you get all these tiny kind of fingernail-sized and starfish. Urchins, yeah, um, yeah, urchin sprats and, and all sorts of things like that, and. Um, over the next kind of few weeks or so, they all start coming out from the kelp, and then you'll you'll find a whole load of um, little baby starfish crawling around the tank. Mm, yeah, that's lovely to see. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, guys, for joining me for this quick chat, and um, we will see you all again in the next podcast. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.